Vaccinations have been a regular practice, especially for people who are exposure to the public, travel extensively, or provide medical services. We'll start tonight's show with the journey of a small team of entrepreneurs who decided to take a different approach to the vaccination problem. By starting with a particularly difficult problem, how can we provide immunization to those people who cannot receive a vaccination because they've been born with a condition known as primary immune deficiency? My name is Jim Connor. Welcome to Game Changers Silicon Valley. My guests are David Johnson, CEO and founder of Gigagen, and Carter Keller, COO of Gigagen. David and Carter, welcome to the show. Let's start with an overview of the primary immune deficiency condition and how we are tre currently treating this disease. Thanks, Jim. Uh, primary immune deficiency <laughs> affects over a quarter million Americans, and so this is a big problem. The problem is that these patients can't make their own antibodies, and uh, mm -hmm. this leaves them susceptible to all kinds of diseases. So mm -hmm. current technology uses a drug called IVIG, or intravenous immunoglobulin, which is a pool of antibodies derived from human blood. As you imagine, that's not a particularly safe product. Uh, there are problems with viral contaminations. There's also batch variation from one batch to another. Uh, and there's also potency problems. So you need a lot of this uh, blood-derived antibody to uh, address the disease. So we're going after all three of those issues with our technology. Mm -hmm. The current technology then takes actual blood from people. Mm -hmm. Does it um, filter or diagnose the quality of uh, contaminants, if I could use that word? or? What, how does that happen? Yeah, so, so the, the suppliers for the current drug mm -hmm. do try very hard to filter out contaminants, but every few years there's always some kind of problem with contamination in, in the blood supply. So our version will be a, a more synthetic or recombinant version, which won't have any of those problems. Mm -hmm. Now you've got a fascinating insightful and uh, quite uh, interesting technology. Yeah. I'll, I'll let you go ahead and describe that. Typically, a company like Genentech, what they do to discover antibodies is they go one at a time. So they'll do a lot of work to identify the best antibody for their particular application. And then they produce it as something called a monoclonal. What we're doing is different because we're actually taking cells from human blood and then isolating the important antibody components as DNA. And DNA is great because you can replicate it endlessly. It's like software. Mm -hmm. And then once you have the DNA in a test tube, you can introduce this into artificial cells, which then create the protein. So we make this massive, we call it polyclonal, library of many, many antibodies, which addresses many pathogens and therefore is useful for immune deficiency. Mm. So your uh, product, if I get this right, uh, produces a range of antibodies. One yeah. batch produces many, not just one antibody, but many. That's right. And then, uh, and then you uh, will administer that to a, uh, a patient. Is that uh, administered by intravenous? Typically intravenous, or another method is called subcutaneous. And that really is the biggest difference, that this is a, it's, a, it's many, many antibodies, and that's the only way you can address many different pathogens. So mm -hmm. we're the first ones mm -hmm. who are doing that. Everybody else is doing monoclonal antibodies. And just to explain to me, the difference between mono, what does monoclonal clonal really mean? Yeah, uh, the, the word is monoclonal, so a single clone, and so that means a single antibody, whereas we use polyclonal, so many, many clones. And how do you know what antibodies you have in there? Are you just taking a batch from healthy people and mixing it all together? Or? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, so another thing that's changed in technology recently, uh, you may have heard in the news about this company called Illumina which does mm -hmm. deep sequencing. So they sequence whole genomes very quickly and very, very cheaply. So this is something that I've built my career on, very fast DNA sequencing. So we are able to know exactly what the components of our libraries are because we literally sequence them with DNA sequencing. Mm. You're uh, making me think this through a little bit and say, I imagine <laughs> now you have a library, just like a library of books, yeah. a library of literally, yeah, a yeah. library of, of uh, antibodies. Yeah. So, oh, let's see. I think this this patient <laughs> needs this. <laughs> and That's this, a great way to think about it. And Carter, how long have you been with the company now? So I've been with David about a year. A year. Um, when he started thinking about ways to take this incredible platform that captures the immune system 
and develop therapeutics with it. My background is in therapeutics, so mm -hmm. I was a good fit, and I was really excited about what he was doing. You know, I'm a pretty much an everyday person, so I have to ask you, in your context, <laughs> what does therapeutics mean? Yeah, so, okay, so it means, it means drugs, pharmaceuticals. Okay. So um, this is a very powerful platform because every antibody has the potential to be a drug. This is the mm. cornerstone of the current biotechnology uh, industry. Companies like Genentech, other biotechnology companies, are looking at antibody therapy as kind of the thing that is going mm. to cure all these diseases. And they take, like David said, they take them one at a time, and we're taking them all. Mm. <laughs> so you're uh, addressing the primary PID, primary immune deficiency. That's right. Is that where people just are genetically born without any immunizations or immunities, I should say? 250,000 people in the United States don't make any antibodies and leaves them very susceptible to infection. And these patients die often very early from infection if they don't get treatment. Wow, is there a primary thing they die of infection-wise? Is it something that gets to them first? Yeah, so there's a few infections that people are very worried about, things mm -hmm. like pneumococcus, and even influenza can be very dangerous really? for a primary immune deficient patient. So things that you and I live with every day, these patients have to worry about it and they I can't see. travel, they're, they're homebound, and they get infusions of the blood-derived product, IVIG, every three weeks. Mm, every three weeks for their life. For the rest of their life, for in the order to lead a, a somewhat normal um, existence. And if they stop, they're susceptible? Yeah, and so there are places in the world where there isn't access to this drug because the supply is limited mm -hmm. due to it coming from human blood donations. And so those patients in, in you know, a lot of them in China and, and Northern Africa, they don't have access to this drug and, and they die very early of infection. Mm. Yeah. So yours is a synthetic. Yes. You can produce as much as you want. Are there any limitations mm -hmm. in your production? So these are grown in large uh, bioreactors. So mm -hmm. it's kind of, if you've ever seen maybe like a brewery <laughs> where, they, where they, they make beer, it's, it's kind of like that, big steel yeah. tanks. Yeah. And uh, so those are expensive facilities. So that is a, a, a primary limitation. Mm. Uh, so one of the challenges as a company is being able to afford to make enough drug which we can then sell. Is there some acceptance now in the medical community, the treatment community of your technology? Yeah, so we spent a lot of time talking to doctors. I think that's a mistake that a lot of uh, biotech entrepreneurs make is that they don't talk to doctors early on, which you, know, you really should do because you want to know who is going to be prescribing your drug. Uh, so we talked to doctors and we, we basically told them what we're building, you know, would you be interested? Here's different things we could do. And uh, now, I mean, at the beginning, they said, no, nah, no, maybe not. But then we kind of tweaked what we were doing in a way that we think addresses the big problems that we know about in, in this field and which doctors have now backed up as being the biggest stuff. The initial rollout is to the PID, the um, primary uh, immune deficiency patients. Do you go past that? That's 250,000. Is that yeah. a permanent body of people? Or we decided for primary immune deficiency because this is a good use case for this drug where it's really well understood clinically and the drug already exists and we want to replace that. So it, it made a lot of sense from a development perspective. Uh, however, there's huge opportunities for what we're doing both in autoimmunity and in cancer. So we funded our company partially through partnerships with big pharmaceutical companies. Mm -hmm. And we have two deals right now. One is an oncology deal, another is a, uh, well, we have four deals total, but one of them is a, is a autoimmune deal, another is an oncology deal. So we have really exciting applications for, for those indications as well. You're a, um, you're, a, you're a new breed of entrepreneur because <laughs> you're funding the company with your research and your partnerships yeah. and some, some grants from the NIH, mm -hmm. I believe, and any other, anybody else? We took a little seed uh, from a venture capital, but uh, over 90% of our, of our dollar intake so mm -hmm. far is from grants and through partnerships. So partnerships. this would have been unheard of 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. It's a completely different model. You have to be scrappy as an early stage <laughs> biotech mm -hmm. in terms of funding these very expensive programs mm -hmm. to bring a drug to market. So we didn't look at one source of funding. We really wanted to overlap the private sector as well as, as the public mm. sector. We have a lot of people I know who do watch this who are in life sciences, and I'm, I think they're just itching to ask, how did you do that? I mean, did you go? <laughs> are you related to the pharmaceutical? <laughs> how do you get in the door? How do you make progress through this huge corporation that's got 
umpteen divisions? What a wonderful question. Um, yeah, it, it can be a very difficult thing to do. Um, some of it is based on relationships. One great story is before I joined David, I, I went and I did diligence on the company by going to 80 of my contacts from Genentech and other places that I had worked and said and saying, is this technology something new? How would you use this technology? And there were a couple of those people that came back to me and said, we need this technology now. Can we do a business development contract? <laughs> and um, and that was before I joined the company. So I knew I had something good that we could create <laughs> right. some value. So that was the due diligence you did before yeah. you joined the company, which was uh, insightful. <laughs> that led to these partnerships. That led to yeah. these. What, uh, well, what led you to do this? I mean, you've been in the, in the life science area for a number of years. I, I looked at your bio. You even you have an MBA here, which you took recently. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, but what is your, what? What made you wake up one day and say, "I think I'm going to leave that other environment and go do this"? I mean, I think I have this uh, this intent to always do things that are impactful, and I know that gets that word gets used a lot around Silicon Valley. But really, if you're doing biotech, you are saving people's lives, and you're you're doing something that's really impactful directly to the way people's people live. And so to me, that's very important. Uh, it often means that, yeah, we have lean times and we have to hustle in ways that a tech entrepreneur wouldn't have to. So I think uh, this has just always been my thing to do. It's not necessarily you know, a choice. It's just what I do. <laughs> Some people are born to do yeah, this, exactly. and there is no choice, right? <laughs> exactly. You have the same. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. I, I would say that there is an additional burden when you're doing this type of company, because at the end of the road is a patient that needs a drug, and and so you don't want to mess the company up or mess that drug's path to that patient up. Mm -hmm. And so, um, in addition to kind of how rewarding it is, it's also very intense because you need to yeah. get on top of that learning curve and shepherd this drug to. That that patient at the end of the day. So. I think you have worldwide markets, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. You do it worldwide, and uh, yeah. you're going through FDA processes now for approval. Do you mm -hmm. have to go through that with every country you're going to sell it to? Right? Yeah, you do. Yeah. So so you have to plan very carefully, you know, which countries to roll out to first, uh, you know, and this Carter's expertise, I guess. Uh, but uh, yeah, you, d you do have to go through every country. Yeah, the nice thing about the way that we're making the IVIG is that we we can make an unlimited supply. And so mm -hmm. countries that don't have access to the drug now mm -hmm. would be able to get access because of the way that we make the drugs. Mm -hmm. so. so your model will be to make it, to manufacture it one way or another, license manufacture, whatever, package it and just put it to, through distribution or some large pharma company, is that correct? That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the nice thing uh, is that there already is a distribution network for the current drug. We're mm -hmm. just making a better version, and so we can call up those distributors and do similar kinds of deals with them. What should we expect in the next 18 months, two years? Are you going to make uh, the Wall Street Journal front page, <laughs> or is this going to be uh, 60 minutes? So within 18 months, we hope that we're actually doing our first testing in, in humans. I see. Probably will take a little bit longer, but our goal right now is within 18 months to be there. Yeah, I think um, I think definitely the technology is something that will catch people's interests. We're the only company that's ever made a polyclonal mixture of antibodies, and it really is the way of the future for medicine. And so it's a very elegant solution to a, a very big patient need, and so we expect to uh, both be in the news as well as bring this drug to the patients that need it. What's the best way for interested parties to follow up or contact you? So uh, we have a website. It's uh, gigagen.com. Uh, and uh, there's a contact uh, dialog box there. It's just info at gigagen.com. Mm -hmm. And that actually goes directly to me. JP Morgan does a healthcare conference yeah. every year. Do you, yeah. uh, do you plan on going to that maybe uh, next year, do you think? Or is that yeah, we go every year. Uh, I think as a small company, you have to be very scrappy yeah. <laughs> and, and get a lot of meetings. But we've actually gotten deals by, by going around JP Morgan and telling people what we do and, and getting their interest. It's so a nice, we'll be there. yeah, it's yeah. a very nice concentrated group of biotech entrepreneurs and investors, and it's a wonderful place it's great. to g teach people about GigaGen. Great. Well, I want to thank both of you, David and Carter, for your yeah, time. I, I, I'm fascinated by the uh, invention or by the discoveries you made and your focus and your continuing work to research. You know, this is a pretty tough area to explain, but I want to thank you for coming in. Yeah. I wish you every success, and I'd welcome uh, hearing more about you in the future. Thanks for having thank us. You, thank you. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of Game Changers Silicon Valley. Each week we'll address an area of innovation that may emerge as the game changer of tomorrow. You can follow us on our Facebook account or subscribe to our YouTube channel. We'll be right back with our second segment on the issue of crowdfunding.